Okay, so you're you're touring at the moment, playing Aqualung in its entirety. Um, mm. Does that album still feel fresh to you when you play it after 50 years? Yeah, I mean, it, I didn't know if it would or wouldn't, but um, until we actually started rehearsing it, and um, and it, and it and it did. I mean, I, I can't I can't tell you why, uh, but uh, it, it could have been really tedious and um, lethargic. And uh, but but it, it it sounded fresh and exciting, and you know that the music came alive, and and even things um, like My God, which we haven't I haven't played for a long long time. Right. Uh, it's one of our best songs in the set because we we just rearranged it. It's the feels different. We put a new middle section in where the flute solo was. Right. We do a Palladio by Carl Jenkins, mm -hmm. uh, and it's absolutely seamless it's 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 it works so good and um yeah i i, I was really pleased and the acoustic songs sound great it, it i mean it, it actually does work as as a continuous piece of music so i i'm, I'm i was very happy it, it might not have done right it's uh i mean are there, any pieces, are there any pieces on the aqualung album that are Perhaps a little bit tricky because you haven't played for a long time. I mean, you said "My God," yeah. but uh, um, yeah. up to me. Was that one that was in the set list quite recently? That's quite that one well, doesn't end a lot. Everything's in there. Yeah, the whole album. Yeah, we don't yeah. miss anything. Yeah, it all sounds great, and yeah, uh, yeah uh, it, it's it's good. You know, I, I have to say that I, it was an idea. <clears throat> Somebody else came up with the idea, uh, and and I dismissed it and. Um, and then thought about it and looked at the music and thought how we would do it. Uh, but I, I, I would never continue playing that theme unless I really enjoyed doing it. So it's, uh, it's, it's always a labour of love. Oh, fantastic. I mean, uh, coming to see you is like a real toll fest. I mean, you had Dee Palmer. Uh, you, Clive Bunker, is he still with you? I mean, you, in, uh, I'm just wondering, in terms of compiling a set list, Hmm. Are there areas of the Tull catalogue which you can now explore, which you couldn't have done within yeah. the parameters of Jethro Tull? Yeah, we, we, we can play anything. And, and um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, uh, essentially the, the, the Aqualung concept is sort of past its date because uh, the COVID put it back two years. Yeah. So if, if, had, if, if it hadn't have happened, we, we would have been finished with it last year and moved on to the next project right. and uh, the next project I'm working on and, and it will be really uh, very very different it will ha have a lot more, more of my music in it but it'll also have some tall music which has never been played and, and I, I just want to always explore areas that n nobody else has been to right. So. Well, I, I'm. I look forward uh, with with bated breath to Martin Barr plays Passion Play in its entirety. Yeah, well, there's some great stuff in there, you know, and and uh, it deserves to be played, and and it works well. It's demanding, but but it's rewarding, and and as long as people recognise the music, yeah. that, that they appreciate that we're playing it, and mm -hmm. it's uh, that there's a huge catalogue, and and luckily we can change the set pretty well completely from if we wanted to from night to night yeah i mean as a young guitarist i mean uh my re my research is that your first uh, gig with jethro tull was the 30th of december 68 at the winter gardens in penzance yeah uh, mm -hmm. three weeks later in new york supporting blood sweat and tears you were supporting hendrix i mean how overwhelming was that for you as a young guitarist oh uh, well it was it, it it was um um it, it was overwhelming and um we played with Hendrix in Scandinavia, mm -hmm. um, but he, he was such a nice person that, that he, he put me at my ease. You know, that, that, that it, it was like making friends with somebody. It was a, he was a very, um, very um, modest, humble person. And, uh, and I learned a lot from that because, <clears throat> you know, it could have been the other way around. Yeah. It could have been very intimidating and it would have, made it very difficult for me but uh yeah, yeah I, I think in the first year we, we, we played with every super group on the planet and mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's good you know I, I i like pressure you know i, I don't like 
to not, not to be challenged. Mm -hmm. So from those days to, to now, I, I enjoy being really put in at the deep end and, and seeing what happens. And that's what music is about. You know, you, you don't go the safe route. You, 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 you know, you, you dip your, your finger in the hot water and uh, yeah. see what happens. And uh, that, that hopefully it, it comes good. And, and usually it does. Well, I was, I was interested to read on your, your website that you, it says you shared a stage with Pink Floyd. Now, I know Tull played with Floyd in Hyde Park in 68, mm. but I thought that was prior to you joining. Yeah. Where, when else did you play with Floyd? Uh, I played with Hopscotch. Now, oh. Hopscotch became the average white band. Oh, okay. But, yeah, Alan Gorry was, was a friend of mine. Is a friend, you know, <laughs> haven't seen him for a long time. But, but the, um, Hopscotch had the flat above Gethsemane. All in right. Physic. So uh -huh. we became friends, and um, and and Alan played on on one of our record, uh, one of our demos for um, uh, for uh, Dick James music. We did an Elton John track, mm -hmm. Lady Samantha, and yeah. uh, Alan Gorry played on it. So so we, we we got on really well, and 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 during that relationship. I'm, I met Turl and joined Turl, and when I told Alan and the guys, they were so pleased. Right. And they said, right, we're, we're doing a gig in Dundee, right. over Hogmanay. Uh, we're, we're supporting Pink Floyd, do you want to come up and play? Mm -hmm. So I, I went up to Dundee and, um, and played with um, Hopscotch. Yeah, so obviously uh, Sid had gone by then. This was uh, Gilmore Wall. Yeah, it, it, in fact, it was uh, Dave Gilmore's first gig. Oh really? Uh, yeah. what, was, what, what were they like to get on with? Were they okay or? Oh, I didn't meet them. I didn't. No, I really just played with them. Uh, oh, okay. I mean, I wouldn't have dared say hello to Pink Floyd. I mean, who am I? But, <laughs> no, they were great. You know, they were great, and and I, I just enjoyed listening to them. And um, you know, yeah, it, 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 I, I mean, I, I was nobody, and um, and Hopscotch the same. You know, just a support band. Yeah. And, yeah went on to better things and uh, uh, it's just a, a, a night, I guess, written in parts of history that, that all those people got together and went on to better things. Dave Gilmore became Pink Floyd, uh -huh. Alan Gorry became Average White Band and, and I became Jethro Tull, so it was oh. an interesting evening. <laughs> I'm interested. I mean, how glad were you that uh, Jethro Tull kind of changed musical direction with the the stand up album? They moved away. Well, from well yeah, I, I, it, I mean, it wasn't a relief, but I was never a blues guitar player, yeah. uh, and I'm still not a blues guitar player. Um, so I, I, I never understood what, what, why they singled me out to be the guy in the band. But then they looked at Tony Iommi. Yeah. And he wasn't a blues guitar player either, so right. I, I think the, the the change in direction had already been thought through mm -hmm. by Ian uh, before I joined, um, and, and and I just think he, he we got on because neither one of us had uh, any um, restrictions in what we wanted to do in music. You know, we we just had a you know I hate to use the word expression, but we had blank canvases. Right. And, um, uh, and that's great. I mean, in those days, it just meant, you, you know, you, you had no plan, you know, you, know, you, you weren't stuck in any rut. In, in fact, I, I just found the blues very restricting. You know, most <clears throat> guitar players in the late 60s playing the blues, they all sounded the same. And, and it didn't do anything for me at all, you know, it never inspired me. And I just thought, well, whatever I do, it won't be that. I didn't dislike it. Yeah. I just didn't feel a part of it. It just wasn't for me. You know, it just didn't uh, tick my box, as it were. And, uh, and, and I think Ian had figured out that being a blues band w w wasn't the future. So it, w w we were, it was an ideal situation for both of us. Right. Well, it's interesting, you know, in the... Um... Uh, the sleeve notes to uh, benefit the new edition that you, uh, I think it's you that states that you feel that the benefit album quote is a huge step up from the stand up album. In what ways do you think it's a huge step up from stand up? Well, I think stand up was an experiment for all of us. So mm -hmm. 
and, and, and the whole band were, were quite nervous and apprehensive as to how it would be received because we were doing uh, you know, a, a 90 degree turn from the blues. Some people didn't like it, you know, that, that they, that Mick had a huge following, quite rightly so. And people... John, John Peel wasn't very happy either, I, I understand. <laughs> he wasn't very happy at all. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's that Mick's shoes were, were, were big shoes to fill, and I, and I never wanted to do it, and, and I'm glad I never had to. But uh, as I say, some people didn't like it, and other people sort of gave it a second listen, uh, but particularly in America, uh, that they, they just accepted it. Because you know, uh, um, well, I, mean, I don't want to be judgmental, but uh, I think in England people had expectations based on what they'd already heard. America just d didn't know anything. They just thought, well, let's go and see Jethro Soul and see what they've got to got to give us, uh, and they liked it. <clears throat> it was a success, and at that point we just breathed a sort of collective sigh of relief. That, that what we were doing seemed to be what people liked and and it, and it gave us a huge injection of confidence and sure. then we went back in the studio and did benefit and um with that confidence um uh, in our pocket so it, it made it a lot more relaxed a lot more positive uh, of a project to do okay now uh, you mentioned in the notes to the benefit album that um listening to some of those earlier tunes had some wrong notes you said not that they were wrongly written uh, they were just <laughs> i wonder which tr uh, tracks you had in mind you, you, you in in, so, in these notes I'll, I'll leave that for the listener um you know we we're, we're uh, all music in the late 60s was naive yeah uh, we're all learning how to play we're all learning about music. We're learning about our instruments, how to write music, how to play music, yeah. how to perform. Uh, so it was all a, a steep learning curve. And, and, and essentially, you, you listen to any um, music or most music from the late 60s, early 70s, and you just hear things that you think, oh, OK. <laughs> That's... That's pushing uh, believability. But yeah, the, 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 um, I mean, I'm a believer that in music you can do anything. Yeah. So, you know, it, it might sound really weird, but there you go. You, you write a piece of music and somebody might say, that's totally incorrect. <laughs> you can't do that in music. But yeah. yes, you can. You can do anything. Anybody can do anything. And, and if, if, if the ear finds it, uh listenable yeah, then yeah. people are going, are going to buy it and listen to it but and enjoy it so it, it's it's uh um, but we were learning uh and and learning very quickly so yeah there were things that that, that didn't sort of um, um it, it, it wouldn't es escape the microscope but there you go i mean it, it's all i just think as naive as it was it needs to be because it's a statement that that's how music was in 68 69 70 71 whatever it, it needs to stay there you, you you don't want to perfect it because you know warts and all that's how music was performed and written and played so it's it's a part of rock and roll history sure sure it's uh um I think you or Ian, in fact, have described your audiences on that first US tour as a little crazy stoned people. I mean, how problematic was that in respect? Um, and in retrospect, is there a part of you that wishes maybe you had done Woodstock? Oh, right. <laughs> well, they're, they're always the crazies. And, and it was the sort of, you know, the, the, the druggy part of music. Yeah. Uh, but we were a part of the crazy people as well because that, that they saw us with the hair and the beards and the and the, the different music, they presumed that we, we were drug crazed hippies as well. Um, so, it, but it, it's fine, you know. We, we we got through it and and we, we weren't influenced by it, and we just took it on the chin, and and try and try to avoid it as much as possible. But um, I just think it was a leftover from the the sort of West Coast hippie 
scene which I, I, I never subscribed to and I, I never thought it was that great you know I just thought yeah. some of those West Coast bands were not my cup of tea you're but, not a Grateful Dead fan then <laughs> uh, they, they all they've all done great things <laughs> uh, but but my opinion as an individual means nothing okay. um, so I'm speaking as an individual mm-hmm. and, and and I would never um, um, <clears throat> endorse my opinion on, a, on an official uh, platform. I don't think that's very fair to do. But I mean, we played with Grateful Dead. Right. And, uh, but Roger yeah. Daltrey said, you know, uh, famously said, you, if you went on after the Grateful Dead, you never got on the stage. They, that's they just right. Played they them. played four hours that the, the concert <laughs> we did with them. Um, I mean, they are, they're a part of history an important part and that they're amazing it, it, it's you know it's, it's it, it doesn't matter uh, and and i'm I, I try not to be judgmental and i'm very opinionated but only in my own home sure and sure. that's where it needs to stay I, I, there's a lot of music i really really don't like but it, it it's not important yeah yeah my opinion isn't going to change the world and and i just think you know live and let live if, if the important thing is everybody was out there playing music mm-hmm. and, and um, it enabled everybody else to do the same. Yeah. You had Yes as a support band, I think 70, yeah. 71. Uh, mm-hmm. What were they like to play with? I mean, they were, oh, doing... they were good. Yeah, the, we, we, yeah, we're friends. We're still friends. Yeah. And they're a great band. I mean, I, I love Yes from the early 70s, you know, Fragile. They're just great songs. And, and, and I, I love John Anderson's voice. But the whole sound of Steve Howe and John Anderson was just magic. It was very different and, uh, you know, and really good songs. We we had a great time. It was a good combination. Sure. Um, I'm interested in uh, Thick as a Brick. I mean, it's been described as a a spoof concept, uh, the mother of all concept albums, so to speak. Um, Mm -hmm. Ian Anderson said, obviously, he was um, a bit miffed at Aqualung being labeled a uh, concept album wrongly in his opinion. <laughs> but he also says that he said more recently that the album is also a gentle ribbing of contemporaries like yes elp king crimson do you think it was a slight prog parody as well of musicians taking themselves way too seriously i think we all took ourselves very seriously <laughs> whatever you say mm-hmm. and, and and i love king crimson yeah uh, i love the music of yes um, yeah, we're all in a, in a sort of category, but but I, I I don't ever think, and I never thought in those days that we were the sort of prog um, universe that yeah. was different from everybody else. We were just English bands playing our music um, in in the states, and people liked it. We're playing it all over the world, uh, and it was all slightly different. But that's what made music exciting. You know, there's, there's a lot of bands out there, and they're, they're all unique. You know, they, they all they all had their own thing about them that that made it very individual and and, and very characteristic. Sure, um, I've got to ask because it's actually my favourite Tull album. That's the uh, Passion Play. I mean, how difficult was it to replicate Passion Play live? Uh, well, it, yeah, it was difficult to play. I mean, I, I, I remember. More than um, thick as a brick. Um, yes, I, I think. <laughs> I, I, well, I remember setting myself a target. Certainly, in both those shows, that I try and get through the whole album without dropping a note. Uh-huh. And I don't think I ever did it. <laughs> but when, when I say drop a note, yeah. it, it, nobody would have noticed. But I mean, it, it was virtually impossible to play uh, 100% perfect because it was so demanding at the yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. It may be now I, I could handle it because I, I understand <clears throat> all, all the, 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 the things that we were doing. But it, it, it was, I think, just as a, a, an exercise in concentration mm-hmm. and memory, uh, it, it was very difficult. But, yeah. but that's that, that demanding... Um, atmosphere m- m- made the music good and it, it made us kept us on our toes so you know there's all you always look forward to the, the uh, performance that would be better than the night before 
Yeah. I mean, Songs from the Wood has some wonderful, fascinating guitar textures uh, on it. I mean, is that all down to you? And uh, how, do you, how did you put together that intro to Pib Rock? Um, <laughs> how did I do it? I do it all the time. I just sit down and with a guitar and think and, and try and, uh, I don't know, I, I, I can't tell you how I do it because <laughs> I, I don't know myself. Uh-huh. But uh, I still do it, you know, I still, and I love it, you know, but I, I did a, a prog track about two days ago for um, um, a songwriter from Venezuela. And, uh, <clears throat> and it, it, was, it was just fun because it was inventive and, you know, you had to come up with something exciting, musical, different, you know, it, it, I, and, and I love having to do that. So how do I do it? I don't know. I, it's, it's, it's my job and, and I do my job and, uh, and I, I don't find it difficult because I find it so rewarding. So, you know, I come up with a piece of music that works great. You know, I've done my job and, and I'm looking at the next thing I have to do. Um, and, and everything's different. You know, every, every song, every album demands something different from you. But as a musician, that's part of what you do. And uh, I think if you couldn't do it or didn't do it, that then you were a failure. <laughs> and uh, hopefully that's not what I am. Uh, you know, it's interesting that Songs from the Wood, Heavy Horses and Stormwatch, many people see them as a trilogy of albums. Uh, do you see them as a trilogy of albums or sort of somehow linked? Or was it just the next album? No, no they were never linked because we were very careful not to sort of repeat, go back on ourselves. So um, we'd do an album, we'd tour it, and then just wipe the slate clean because um, we never, ever wanted to do Aqualung 2 yeah. or From the Wood, The Return. Yeah. That would have been the last thing we ever would have done. Uh, it, it's, it's just uh, an attitude that you move on, and uh, that's what kept Toll going for... 45 years and it's what keeps me going now I just constantly want to change evolve get better write better music play better make better sounds otherwise why would you do it absolutely I mean uh, I don't know if you you're listening to any of these these new remasters and remixes that are done by Stephen Wilson Mm -hmm. but um there was an opinion that the um that possibly maybe that the a remix of Under Wraps might replace the drum sound on that. I mean, how would you feel about that if that were the case? Well, Under Wraps is 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 um is a, is a, a one off, and and I always told Ian that we should re-record it with proper drums. Oh yes, we never wanted to, and uh, the, the drummer that I work with, uh, Darby Tard, uh, would. would play it amazingly it would mm-hmm. bring the album the, the songs are great you know yeah. Under yeah. Rap, really good songs and the peter fatessi is amazing it, it, the, there's great sounds great songs and and the letdown is mechanical drums get yeah. rid of it and get a real drummer it would bring the whole thing alive so i, I don't know i mean the, the, the thing to me would be who would play drums yeah yeah Darby todd marco minimum or um, Terry Bozio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'd, I'd love to hear it if they, that they, they did, because like you, I think it's, a, it's got some wonderful stuff on it. Uh, it it's yeah, just, yeah. That electronic sound really kind of dates it, and it doesn't sound so appealing uh, now when you listen to it. <laughs> but see, I love it, and, and, and the next project that I do, I'm going to be playing two or three tracks off under wraps. Oh, good, good. I'd love to hear yeah, them. It would be very synthy. <laughs> well, I loved A. I mean, A was very synthy as well. I enjoyed that. Uh, yeah. No, I, I think it, it, it's it's of its era, and, and in many ways, you know, it's probably better to leave it alone and just say, you know, it was a child of the eighties, and, and and leave it alone. It's yeah. It's, I mean, I what we did on, on that particular year, um, take it or leave it. Sure, sure. Um, just one last question for you, really, and that is, uh, are there any plans for you to release, record some new music? Um, well, <laughs> yes. Uh, th- th- we're literally at the end of catching up with COVID shit. 
So yeah. um, we go to Canada next month and, and play the 21 shows that we couldn't play at the beginning of the year. Yeah. We couldn't play the year before or the year before that. So we're literally, at the end of July, we will have caught up with everything. Then we, we have a short European tour at the end of the year. <clears throat> but my plan, I, I wrote a lot of music in the two years of lockdown. So I want to do a triple album. Oh, wow. So I want to do new music of mine. And then I, I have all the music that was never released of my solo material. Okay. So I've got like stacks of it and I want to rework it and, mm -hmm. and make it, you know, sort of improve it. And then I've got all the instrumentals that I ever played with Tull. Okay. I want to re-record all of them. So right. three CDs. Wow. That's a lot of material. It's a lot of material, but <laughs> uh, it keep me busy. It keep yeah. me busy. Yeah, good. Well, um, I'm sorry to have dragged you away from your garden on such a lovely day. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> Thank you for doing this interview. I uh, I wish you well and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank so, you. Uh, so thank you very much and and bye bye. Okay, and and tell your wife that I'm enjoying looking at her picture. Yes, yes. Well, if you change your mind about the ten grand offer for the, <laughs> the gold painting. Just let me know. I'll mention that to, to Julie and see what she says. Okay. okay. She's got a Thanks. room full of paintings that she's done that I think are, are really good. I'm sure that you're the same. And she just yeah. like that. To her. Lots, of, lots of paintings. I mean, my wife obviously gets something out of it, uh, yeah, doing it. But we, 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 we find we're going to have to buy another house just to house all these canvases. You know, we're going to have to do something like that. But uh, That's lovely. It's a good thing to do. Yeah, whatever makes you happy, that's what I say. Anyway, thank you very much, Martin. All the best. You're very welcome. Okay, bye-bye. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.